So what we're really going to explore for the latter part of this is what does it mean to be a director? What does that role actually mean and gov what does governance mean? Um, and that's talking about the roles, the risks, and even talking about ethics a little bit. Um, and, and what is ethics? What does ethics look like? I mean, we feel it all the time. I think I was talking to several people in the back, you know, I have smaller children and I was just telling them the other day, you know, there's a lot of black and white in the world, but you spend a lot of your life mm, trudging around in this murky sludge that's a lot of ethical quandary, right? And how do you kind of work through that and how do you as a board work through issues that may not be so black and white? So talking about what the role of a director is. So if you are a director on a board, but really a director has three major responsibilities. The first one is fiduciary. And that's really managing the assets and finances of the organization that you are a director of. Um, legal oversight. And then overall management of business decisions. Okay, those are the big picture things. And we'll talk a little bit about what those look like. So um, it's not managing. It's not handling ever, all the day to day. It's setting policy and direction and establishing a plan for the management of, instead of actually doing the management. That is the role of a director. So according to Davis Sterling, which applies to most of you, and I just remember, because there is another board here, which is the new board. VMS, this is the new board. So some of you here have an even different role. Uh, that's there. Um, so, but this is for Davis Sterling. So, many of you fall under this, um, and that says you have a duty of care and a duty of loyalty. And many people go, "Great, what does that mean?" And really, when it comes to duty of care, it's are you doing your due diligence? Are you actually investigating? Are you making decisions that are educated? Are you actually making sure that it's a thought out plan considering the short term and long term management of your community? You also have duty of loyalty. And this really is where you get into that no self dealing. This is where the ethics and not having ties and that perception that you are not um, dishing out contracts to people you know or you know, giving benef benefits to people um, in par or partially. Mindful of that, I want to take a second and really talk about what's the difference between governance and management. Um, there's a great organization called Great Boards, and this is where I got some of this from, and they really do a good job. They have some great information, and I think some of you actually know have subscribed to it. Um, governance is supporting, evaluating, and supporting the organizational manager or leader. For those of you with VMS, that's a big part of your role, right? overseeing and making sure that the leader or leadership in place is doing what they've done. Have you established business goals? What are their metrics that they're going to be assessed on? Approving high level goals and policies. This is not every little policy. That's why you have a team, a management um, entity handling that. But approving the highest level ones, making major decisions, Overseeing management and organizational performance. So a great example that we get really sticky, and I see this not just here, and all my work with boards comes a lot with like compensation. So um, not getting into every single person's pay, but really a board is really going to know what's our compensation philosophy. They're going to establish that. So are we paying at 50th percentile? So it's making large scale decisions or letting the leader do that and supporting them and validating or adjusting them. And really, managing is the execution, which we'll look at. And they act as external advocates and diplomats. There are bigger powers that be that you, know, you need to be in touch with. And you know, if it's coordinating with other cities or other government uh, entities, if there's any of that, the board really handles that external facing um, details. Management, on the other hand, runs the organization in line with the board direction. If the board rolls out a plan and says we're moving this way, management, so whether it's an entity or managing agent, whatever it be, is really actually making that happen. So if you find yourself as a board starting to get stuck and going, oh, we're getting too in the weeds because this happens a lot, we see this a lot, oh, we're doing too much, we're not doing enough, you can really check back. Is this policy and directioning or is this actually executing? And that helps determine, are we governing or managing? 
educating and informing the board. So are you getting reports? Are you getting information from your committees, from your managing agent? Um, they'll seek the board's counsel. They will recommend goals and policies supported by background information. A board isn't in the weeds and in the trenches. Interestingly enough for you, you live in the community, so you see that. So it's a little different than just a general board where maybe it's a hospital or a not-for-profit uh, that you may not actively participate in. So you see that front end. But are you um, letting you, the people in the trenches really report to you and make recommendations? They should frame decisions in the context of the mission and strategic vision and have well-documented recommendations. And bringing the board timely information in concise, contextual, and comparative formats. So that's the difference between those two. And I put that there because we're going to talk a little bit about the duty of, of the duty of loyalty and the duty of care. And I want to make sure that we have clarified what the difference between the two rules are. So according to Davis Sterling, the duty of loyalty is that directors must act in the best interest of the association, even if at the expense of their own interest. So this is more than just embezzling funds. It includes steering the contracts to a family member, taking actions that result in personal benefit to the director at the expense of the association. If this is violated, it can result in liability for any profits that were received. So if you are a board member and you are found breaching this, according to Davis Sterling, you could be held liable for those profits. Any damages caused by the breach and punitive damages. Yes. The question was, some of our associations are corporate, or some are associations and some aren't. For those who are, they're bound by Davis Sterling. Uh, the second one's duty of care. So even if you aren't covered by Davis Sterling, there are similar laws in place that protect, they're just called different things. Um, but there are, this is in general how boards are managed, or what the risks are. When it comes to duty of care, there's the expectation you're going to attend and participate in meetings so you are informed about the association's business. If you have a voting right and ability to influence decisions, it is your duty to be prepared and to participate. You need to make reasonable inquiry regarding maintenance issues, rule violations, etc. Make decisions and keep corporate records. So there is liability in abstaining from every single vote. Um, how that is interpreted and enforced varies. Again, check with legal counsel on that, but that is some of the risks with it. When it comes to Laguna Woods in particular, this goes for all the boards from what I've heard, is that these are the expectations of a director. For those of you already in the role, this should be fairly clear. For those who may be considering running, it's regularly attending all scheduled meetings. This can be in excess of 20 to 40 hours a week, is what I've understood. And as those of you are shaking your heads, saying yes, the least amount I ever heard somebody say in all the work we did was about 10 to 15 hours. And that was on a good week. Um, regularly attending and participating in assigned committee meetings. Being educated, informed, and completing sufficient research in advance of meetings. It's not just attending, but showing up ready to participate in the meetings. Engaging in ethical governance behavior. And we'll look a little bit at what that looks like shortly. And demonstrating business etiquette and professional business behavior. That's critical. And in course two, I think, is where we'll talk a little bit about how do you manage that and how do you state those things. And how do you make sure that what, what is good business etiquette look like? What is professional business behavior and what are the expectations? And again, that may change from board to board. As new members come in and come out, there's different expectations. Some boards I've worked with, they just gel and they have a lot of candor and they say things and then there are others who if anyone looks you know, one direction the other way, people get kerfuffled. And so <laughs> there is a little bit of a difference from board to board and it has to be evaluated and communicated about regularly. If you have concerns or questions about some of that, Again, because there are so many different boards and board types here, I would encourage you to talk to your legal counsel about that and what it looks like and find out anything. Um, again, things are changing as well, so there's a lot of fluidity in this situation. So we're going to talk a little bit about the roles of the board here. And this may vary a little bit from board to board, especially with a new board, and it has a very different type of... Um, role and responsibility 
and how that's handled. So this is in general something, it's a rule of thumb, but it could be different. And different people may come in. You may have someone who comes in as a president or a vice president and they want certain responsibilities or not and delegate that differently. But in general, these are some of the roles. So when it comes to the person who serves as the president of the board, um, it is their job ultimately to uphold the mission and values of the community. I think that one of the key statements here is you are a visible representative of the community and to the community here. You are a part of it, but you are visible and people are watching. And from the feedback we heard when we were doing a lot of the focus groups is that people are very well aware of the fees that they're paying and their assessments month to month, and they want to know that it's being managed well and by people who are professional and care. And so it's really important if you're running for the board to consider that, that you are not just of the community, but you are in service to, and you are in a very visible role, especially if you choose to um, opt in for the role of president. It makes it clear that the board roles to preserve, protect, and enhance the community. They're going to oversee board and committee activities, work with the managing agent and manager to ensure adequate support for the community, and their job is typically to set meeting agendas. Again, some presidents will say that they'll let their secretaries or a vice president chair that. They may delegate certain things, but in general, for boards, this is, this is the role. They typically are going to run the meetings, and many of you who use Robert Rules of Order or some variation of those. Um, so that's uh, part of that. They will interface typically with legal counsel, unless there's a designated uh, appointee. They are also typically the liaison with the managing agent. In many cases, when there's a lot of conduits going and it's pulling the managing agent in multiple directions, many times the president acts as that liaison just to streamline communication, but not always. And typically, they're the ones who are going to sign contracts. Uh, so the question was, is there any standing precedent if a uh, president protocol that um, a president abstains from voting unless there's a tie or they are not a voting committee member? Is that it? I'm not sure. I would assume with bylaws that some places that may be clarified or not. Are you asking st industry standard? And I would argue it depends on the situation because if you have an odd number of members, it depends on the structure, it depends how the bylaws created. I have not seen just one. I'm sure you could research based on size and you know winning down demographics, but I have not seen one practice that I could say from what I've seen there's just one. Okay, the officer role of the vice president. This one looks the shortest, but it's not really. <laughs> Really, you fulfill the president's uh, responsibilities if they are absent, and then you serve at the discretion of the president, typically. So they're going to take the overflow, and it really depends on, that was a pretty exhaustive list for the president. Again, these are generalities. These are standard, just kind of what we see in general. It can shift. Some vice presidents may have a lot more responsibility. Your, you may have defined these roles within your um, board to specify that there may be certain ones. The secretary, typically they're going to keep the papers, documents, and minutes. They're responsible for any additional records. They ensure the minutes are taken correctly and they are maintained in proper order to legally protect the community and board. These are, meet, board meeting minutes, are typically discoverable documents. And so it's really important that somebody who's considering the role of secretary understands that, understands the importance of and the need for documenting accurately, knowing what to document and how to document it, and knowing if there is a discoverable manner or some sort of lawsuit or litigation that your responsibility would be for reporting that. So if that's something that someone's uncomfortable with, that may not be the role for them. Um, they also may be responsible for signing contracts. Sometimes that'll happen. It depends on the board. I've seen that one go about 50-50. So discoverable means if there's litigation, that anything that is kept meeting minutes are something that can be recalled in a case of a lawsuit or any legal manner or maybe arbitration, anything if there is a legal dispute, any notes that are taken 
for meeting minutes are discoverable documents, and even a lot of the financial records as well. Um, there may be some exceptions, but for the most part, they're discoverable. So something that was said, and that's part of it, is understanding, and that's something each board has to recommend, is that they don't have to necessarily transcribe every word that was stated. You are not a stenographer, but it's just m recording the actions, but making sure that all of the actions needing to be recorded are, and knowing, that's part of the education of that role, is knowing what needs to be documented and what does not. But it is not the role of stenographer, you're right. So the next role is treasurer. They're gonna oversee the financial affairs of the board. They also request appropriate financial reports and assistance in selecting an auditor. So if you go through regular audits, which is a typical practice, I think is it, it may be legally mandated for certain of the corporations. They monitor financial records. They notify and report any issues, challenges, overages, discrepancies, etc., to the board in a timely fashion. So people who are considering running for the treasurer probably need to have a better than average acumen when it comes to financial matters and reporting. Again, remember we talked about you need a team of people with different skills and competencies and experiences. Some of these um, experiences and competencies fit better in certain roles. So people with financial backgrounds, when you're appointing or vote, do you guys vote or appoint your positions once you're on the board? You said, so the role of the treasurer is beyond this. It's also including requesting documents and knowing the budget and where it's coming from. So it's not emotional decision making, but it's actually based in budgetary fact which is part of monitoring the financial records. It's knowing what's coming in and out and reporting that and, and being able to provide probably insight on how to manage those ins and outs. And so those are the typical main roles. I know some boards may have other titles and positions within the boards, but those are the big ones because, again, we're covering a lot of different boards and board types here. Um, but then you have committees, and this is really the heartbeat of a board. You have your executive team who's really working on getting the, you know, the highest level of decision making and understanding the responsibilities, but the work really gets done. That research we talked about, a lot of the work when we listed all the things that you have to do as a board member comes in the committee work. And these really support your board. They are an extension of your board team. And their role is to really research and make recommendations because governing well takes a lot of time. So to get into the nuances of finding the pianos and figuring out, researching what our options are for various changes, um, all of those things um, need to come in through your uh, committees. So they are best represented by a cross-section of your community because then you get a variety of perspectives and make sure that you're equally representing. Remember, that's your goal is to represent your whole community. Are all perspectives accounted for? They do not make decisions or take actions necessarily. They make recommendations that are well researched to the board to make that final decision. They protect committee members, or it protects the committee members and the association both. I like to say this is a great gateway for people considering running for a board, especially in an organization like yours that is so large. Each of these boards have so much time commitment, and it's a long period of time that you're going to be committed to this time and energy, that it's a great way if people are testing the waters and saying, I think I might be interested, tell them to get involved in a committee if they're considering it so they understand. Not sure question was, I'm not sure on the last line. It allows, it's a good place to, a gateway to, for people who want to get involved on the board and understand, so they're not jumping in blindly into the work that's done. It also allows for further research to be done. It protects the board because they don't have time to necessarily do their due diligence on every single decision that needs to be made. So it allows for a greater reach of the board and information to do due diligence. Because if you serve on a committee, it's, it's for both and. It helps just protect from the due diligence issue. People are, I think, hung up on the word but protect. We talked about due diligence a few minutes ago. You have to research and vet. But a board cannot physically, you guys cannot physically, mentally, emotionally be responsible for fully researching every single thing. So the use of committees helps to supplement that so you have extra arms and legs to make sure that due diligence has been done. We have done a study on this before we made this investment. We made sure we knew what all of our options were before we made a decision. It's basically how you don't do 60 hours worth of work in a week instead of 30. Accepted by the board. 
Okay, so your statement was, uh, what I see a lot is that people come in and say this is what the committee thinks should happen and that should be executed. And what I said was that it's a recommendation. Right. In some cases, yes. You may have some committees who have executive authority to make decisions. Again, we're talking about five different boards sitting in here, all of different corporate structures, all operating under different bylaws. So I'm trying to give generic yet specific information, but there may be situations I don't know about that may actually, the committee may be able to make. Is there any situations that you guys know of where a committee can actually make an executive decision or is it all recommendations? The executive committee is the only one. Okay, so yes, then that sounds like, again, not a lawyer, haven't, not purporting to be one, but it sounds like from what I'm hearing, the CCNRs and bylaws say that it is a recommendation and that the executive committee will make that decision. The statement was there was a comment to support that, which was if you do not have faith in your committee to do their due diligence, maybe you need to find different committee members. If you do have faith, you may delegate. I'm not sure on the legal ability to do that. I'd have to look into it. I think that their, their support would be just voting for your recommendation. So there are things that are put in place to manage the risks and to provide protection for board members. That's why you have CCNRs. These provide structure for decision making. They provide structure for action that helps protect board members. So these are the legal foundations in, of the nature of the corporation. There are multiple different types of corporations and entities in this room, and that's why each of you have different CCNRs is because it protects the operations for each of them. It creates legal structure and limitations on corporation activities. It gives some basic operational principles of the entity. We walked through those before. Remember, I pulled some about what the roles are of the director. Um, and it requires a majority of owners of stakeholders to make changes on certain things. The things that do require are typically spelled out in your CCNRs. You have your bylaws, and these are your governing documents. Those also provide some structure to help minimize risk. And then your articles of incorporation, which establish the structure, nature, and legal status of the corporation. All of those documents are there for a reason. You also have access to legal counsel through some proximity on your board um, that helps clarify those things. If you have questions, this may have moved because I understand the website's moving and shifting. So we'll have to update it as it changes. You can actually, anyone can access the governing documents. And to test it, I actually, when I was putting together my presentation, went and found everyone's governing documents to make sure it worked. So um, they are available to everyone. They are on the website. I found, I found all the documents I needed. So some of you at CCNR, some had bylaws. All of the legal documents, whatever they are, are made available online to everyone. So to clarify is that some people will say, that any, what was stated was any board member should have access and should have in their hand and possession access to those documents. The question was, is the United CCNR is available? They don't have them. If there's discussion, should they or shouldn't they? Again, living, breathing, fluid documents that were working with here. You have legal documents, they're all accessible to everyone in the entire community, actually. So Davis Sterling also provides some sense of protection and parameters for those of you who fall under Davis Sterling. So Davis Sterling says, a volunteer officer or director is not personally liable in excess of the association's insurance for bodily injury, emotional distress, wrongful death, or property damage, or a loss of result of a torturous act or a mission of the officer director if all of the following criteria are met. That was a mouthful and that's why it's written on the slide. Basically, it requires that an act of omission was performed within the scope of the officer's or director's role. If the act or omission was performed in good faith or it was not willfully, wanton, or grossly negligent. Okay. This is where our legal system comes in. The definition of what that looks like is going to vary from situation to situation. The key is, have you done, when we talked about duty of care and duty of loyalty, have you done due diligence? Was it done ethically with no um, benefit to you as an individual necessarily or somebody that you are close with? If you have done your work properly, 
Davis Sterling typically will protect you. And then there's much more parameters down below where it talks about it. Um, again, if you have questions, you want to talk to um, your legal counsel. So with GRF, oops, GRF's risk and liability is there's, according, this is what's in the agreements, is there's no liability except for transactions for willful and wrongful m misconduct. That's what the documents say now. It's up to interpretation <laughs> of how that looks, but that also goes back to a duty of care and a duty of loyalty. How that is executed and judged against is up to um, our legal system. There is gray area in that. For those who are in the world currently, which is you sitting in this room, this is probably information you know. For those who may be considering running for a board, this, there are some risk terms to understand. There is a recall by a removal of a director or mutual members. In any regular or special meeting of mutual members, a director may be removed without cause by a majority vote of the membership voting, and a successor then there may be elected to fill the created vacancy. This may shift a little bit. There may be a little more specifics from board to board. Um, but in general, that's the rule of thumb I found in the documents. A resignation is a, when a director is not recalled by others, but resigns on their own, at their own discretion. And that leaves the vacancy, which means there's openings um, in seats on the board, which could be from resignation, recall, or other events. The last section we're going to talk a little bit about is ethics. Really, uh, ethics are touchy. It's sticky, and what feels right to wrong may feel wrong to another. They're also uh, formed by our background, our values, our beliefs, our upbringing, um, the culture we've grown up in. All of those can have an impact. And this is where that respectful talk and that business manners in listening is really important because what may feel ethically sticky for someone may feel black and white for another person. But it's really important to recognize that if you are sitting on a board and somebody's feeling ethically uncomfortable about an issue, you need to hear them out. And you need to hear why. Because it may give light to the situation you're discussing. But in addition, it may reveal some things you did not know about. Most people aren't going to say, I feel uncomfortable about, or ethically unsure about something, unless there's something there driving it. So hearing them out in a polite, productive, and respectful way is really important. So when it comes to business ethics, what is right and wrong in the workplace and what's right and wrong in regards to the products and services and the relationships to the stakeholders? So this is really thinking about as a board member, who are my stakeholders and are we doing what's in their best interest? This also applies to the corporate governance. As we've said, we'd love to think that our laws and our bylaws and everything's all very black and white and it's clear and there's parameters, but they move and they grow. And as the situation changes and you know, our, we evolve as a community, it can, there's structure there, but there's also some wiggle room. And it's making sure that we're being mindful of that when there is areas that are not quite so black and white, that there is due diligence done to explore and consider those areas. Also, corporate responsibility, which is fulfilling your responsibilities and obligations to the corporation and its stakeholders. This is one that comes up a lot, and we'll talk to boards about it, and it's what are you spending your time doing? What are the areas? So if you're spending many hours of unproductive time and unproductive discussions about issues that are small and not taking the time to really address the big issues that need to be addressed, that's te technically an ethical issue in governance. Ethics isn't just about a decision making, it's also about the process and fulfilling your responsibilities. As well as corporate social responsibility. So do you align your products and services with stakeholder expectations? Adding economic, um, and economic and social value. So the example was given before, do you know what people in your community want? That's an ethical part of governance. It's understanding who your constituents are, who you're in service to, and making sure that just not the ones you know, but that the entirety of the group you represent has their voice, needs, and um, represented. The question was, do we have a rep? Yes, absolutely. There is an ethical responsibility to the people you, to the entity or people. It depends on your board. 
That's where you really have to work as a board and find out what's best for the community. So maybe people have opinions and they're split right down the middle, but how do you rep what's best for the future of your community? And that's going to look different and it's going to be interpreted differently in different situations. Because I know if I'm saying that, all of you are thinking about a specific situation in mind, and I'm not thinking about any of them. I'm talking about in general. So the, what, what I'm hearing you say, and I'm just repeating it because you're further from the mic, is that what I, you, your interpretation of what I'm saying is that your job is to represent the whole people and not necessarily special interest groups. So if they're asking for things that are out of alignment with the vision and mission of your organization, then that's not what your role is to do. So the statement in our state is that it's hard to know the meeting, of, you know, it's basically the squeaky wheel gets the oil is what you're saying, is that the special interest groups speak louder and it's hard to understand the community. And I will say in governance, particularly, and I've heard this here, because people disengage too. There is a sense that people have gotten tired of the politics and have said, I'm done, I don't want to deal with it, I'll just live my life. And how do you hear that voice? So there is that sense, and this is the challenge of any director on any board. Listen to the constituency, but your goal is to manage your assets, depending on what it is, manage your organization, but thinking about the whole entity in the big picture. So we're getting in, but the example that was given is sometimes we have these 200 clubs and there's conflict between what they want and then the community as a whole. And now we're getting into just kind of talking about some statements. I want to be mindful of time because I think these are really productive discussions, but I, I am aware of that. And I see this on boards all the time. Any type of board in any organization, there's always going to be, even as you said, in our political system, this is what happens. Um, so it's really making sure that everybody's interests are represented, because there may be special interest groups that do need to be represented amongst the general community, and it's balancing both for the betterment of the organization in which you are serving. Um, when it comes to ethical decision making, and this is where I want to spend a couple minutes just talking through this because this is where it gets touchy and I started talking about that. The first thing is recognizing there's an ethical issue. And this gets back to that respect and corporate manners and if we're treating each other kindly and respectfully and we truly say we may not see eye to eye but I'm going to hear you out anyway because you have value. Even if I don't agree with it. We are representing a diverse community with diverse opinions, which means we're going to have diverse opinions on our board. If somebody raises an issue they feel is ethical, like I said, there's a reason. There's something in there that's making them feel sticky about it. And we asked in our boards, right, what are the good characteristics? Is that they're going to stand up and say when something feels it needs to be said, and that they are going to maybe take the unpopular opinion. That said, it has to be done respectfully. Absolutely, or it is counterproductive. So if you are the one feeling the ethical issue, you can just slam your pen, and I'm giving examples I've seen not here, but in other boards and other leadership meetings. I don't, nope, don't agree with it, don't like it. That is not going to be productive. It's not going to go anywhere. Or somebody starts saying, oh, this makes, you know, I just, have we thought about this? Is there a perceived conflict of interest? We know there isn't, but could there be a perception and they get caught off? Don't worry about it. Not letting somebody voice their opinion, that's not ethical board opinion, uh, behavior either. Again, it's got to be done respectfully. If somebody's out of line and being disrespectful, that's okay to say, you know, time out, let's talk about this, but not like that. But it's important that if somebody's having that issue, they're raising it, there's a reason. It may be unfounded, but there might be something there. And doing your due diligence is making sure that there's nothing there. Then it's getting the facts. It's really hard to serve on a board that you're so passionate about sometimes because you're committed and you're passionate about it, right? The thing that makes you so great can also be a limitation because when we get passionate about something, we can get emotional about something and we do that sometimes because that's when we're passionate. There's something that happens. We also have to recognize that we need to take the emotion out of it and get the facts. And if you are having interpersonal conflict about an ethical issue, this is the best way to manage it. Time out. It's a really valid, I can see why you're concerned. Validate what they're saying. I see why you're concerned. They may be wrong and you may think that you know why. I understand why you're coming that way. Can you talk to me about the facts? And if they get off track, Okay, I understand. This is a stupid idea because, nope, we're not saying 
Something about value. Can you tell me the facts? Why do you think this isn't a good idea? Can you give me the numbers? Can you give me the logical reasons? Let's walk through the facts on this. So sometimes when you get in an ethical situation, it's the best thing to do interpersonally is just sticking with the facts. Then it's evaluating alternative actions. So sometimes it's important, especially when we talked about getting on the train, even when we disagree, if you walk through the alternatives, you have a better chance of people moving forward with you. Because they're gonna see why it didn't work. It's not just because my friend George is back, right? It's not because George wanted to do it. It's because we walk through the options and George, who is resistant to the plan, now sees that, oh, I didn't think about that. In 2025, that's gonna have an implication on our budget. And you're right, this other thing's gonna come up in 2025 as well. I hadn't thought about that. Okay, I see why we need to make this decision. By walking through the alternatives, it allows everyone to see all of the different sides of it, so nobody's making an uninformed decision. It minimizes the emotional value, as well as ensures you've done your due diligence. So it covers a lot of different bases. If, if you've gotten the facts, now some people are gonna debate what the facts are, and I think that's what you're getting at, is if I think it's a fact and uh, someone else doesn't. And what I'm talking about is all of this is under the guise of ethical, respectful conversation. So much comes back to, if we're really treating, I mean, really we want to get back to it, it comes back to the golden rule. If I want my opinion to be heard, and I want my facts to be heard, I sure better be ready to listen when somebody else is going to talk about theirs. Evaluating alternative action, again, covers due diligence. It also ensures that you got more buy-in moving forward. Then making the decision on the ethical issue. And then when it comes time to action, that's the key. Everybody has to, even if they disagree, if the trains left the station, it's really important for your community that you're moving forward. Because the second you start going, well, we did it, but, and then you sit down and you start the swirling, it doesn't provide unity in your community. You want to make it a great place to live? Your board's going to set some of the tone for that. So just because you made a decision, it doesn't mean, nope, we put our stake in the sand, this is it. The statement was, just because the decision was made doesn't mean it's necessarily final. You may come across information, you're moving forward and find out, oh my gosh, this is going to cost six times what we thought it was. We just don't have the budget for it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's when you have to revisit and you go back and say, ethically moving forward with this decision is not right. Does it feel right? I don't want to bankrupt our community. I don't also want to look like I'm backpedaling and we didn't know what we were doing. So you go through the cycle again. We're in an ethical quandary. We're this is going to put a financial burden that's undue on our community. Okay, let's get the facts. We made this decision. Let's talk about it. This is also we're communicating with your residents is important. So they don't see the waffling and back and forth. Guess what? I think most people, most, are pretty reasonable. We all understand we've lived enough life to know we make decisions all the time and then we find out. Communicating the whys and the hows with one another, that's so important. Well, when you have a strong personal agenda, technically if that's, if that's interfering with the work of other, the work that needs to be done, if it's always focused on one thing, that's when your board, whether it's the president or whoever you've delegated, that, that should have been clarified up front on the expectations. When you sit down as a board and set the expectations, we're working impartially to manage this entire community. If there's something you're passionate about, channel that to a committee. But th that technically should be, and again, where we have emotional things, a lot of communication and expectation setting up front manages it instead of making it a personal issue, it's a performance issue. You're on the board, we made an agreement. Up front, we agreed we're going to work on these things, and that's not happening. So can we talk about that? Performance expectations are so critical. That's why we all have job reviews growing up through our careers and all those things, because when you set an expectation, it depersonalizes the action, and it becomes about performance, and not about the person. You're a delightful person. We're having a challenge here. So when there's an agenda within your board, when that happens in general, that's how I say, especially if you're starting on a new board, you have a great chance to set expectations. What are our metrics for success going to be? Most boards I know, almost every single board I know of, they assess themselves regularly. I think we talked about it in the recommendations when we went through our reporting. What, what is the standards for performance for a board? 
Are you telling your community, this is what we're doing? Have you set those expectations for yourselves and out there so there's some standard of behavior? Those are really important things for a board to do. They're hard conversations to have. They are. But it also allows for continuity. So when a board changes and rolls over, it allows it for not to be agenda driven. Somebody comes in, I want to make this one change. If you have a standard of metrics that everyone agrees to moving forward, when new people come, you're all based on the same standard. So it provides continuity and leadership. How important is it for it to have a satisfaction survey of the residents? My first response is, how effective is the survey? Um, here's the thing about surveying. It's taking a snapshot at a point in time. So I, I, we work with a lot of organizations and they do this of their staff. So a similar idea and they call them engagement surveys. So how happy are you at work? How happy are you to come into work? How much do you like living here? You could love living here on Tuesday, get a traffic ticket Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday. <laughs> You don't like living here so much, or your neighbor's driving you insane, and their dog's been barking all night. And so they are a snapshot temporarily. So while surveys can be really effective, they can also not give you the best data. I think it's, um, it's a tool, and it's one of the tools you can use to understand how your community is feeling. Um, but again, I'm wary because it has to be a well-written survey, executed properly, through the right channels. So governance, too is going to get a little bit more in logistics. It's going to be kind of like how things, it's a little more process and procedure, and it sounds like we need to talk about some of the people stuff. What does the leadership stuff look like? How do we handle difficult personalities? How do we, how do we put preventative measures? There are things we can do in advance to keep from the people stuff becoming people stuff and focus on the work that needs to be done. I'm going to let Mike close this out. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's always fun. Okay, well, thank you for coming, and we'll see you next at 102.